Hello everyone, my name is Wayne Gates. I'm a graduate student at Northern Kentucky University working with Professor Jankowski in the Media Ethics class and I have been given the opportunity to discuss media ethics with you as they relate to credibility. The credibility subject is pretty dense as you saw from your reading so I'd like to go over some of the ways that that can affect you and the perception of you as a journalist the perception of the platform you work for and the perception of the journalism industry in general moving forward as we are into the well into the 21st century. For a little bit of background about myself, if you don't recall from the post at the beginning of the at the beginning of the class, I have been in the media business most of my adult life. I had worked in radio for about 10 years. I worked in television news as a photographer and a producer for another 12, and I've recently spent the past 11 years as a newspaper editor responsible for content for three newspapers in rural Ohio. So I've had exposure to the journalism business, both from the broadcast and print perspective, and have had a lot of interaction with the public as to what they think we do versus what people inside journalism think we do. And I think that is the biggest disconnect because people don't understand what journalists do or why. And when they don't understand why something is done, they tend to ascribe motives to those journalists that make sense to them. So I'll get into a little bit more detail here in just a bit. One of the things that I took away from the chapter five reading that I looked over was that there are a lot of ways that the credibility of a journalist or the platform they work for can be affected. First and foremost, it's simple mistakes. Uh, that is one of the things that people tend to overlook. When people think about journalism credibility or credibility of individual journalists, they, they turn to uh, ideological bias, which I'll talk about in just a minute, but even simpler than that, if a journalist makes a mistake, it can affect the product and the view in which the journalist is, whole, is held in a couple of ways. First of all, if it's something obvious that the general public can see, um, some even beyond a spelling error or punctuation or tense or something like that, if it's beyond basic English, if a journalist makes a factual error in a story and that, and that people are aware of that factual error, then that brings every other assertion or fact that the journalist has written about or spoken about if they're in broadcast into question. If they're going to get this wrong, then what else are they getting wrong? So that immediately undercuts any sort of credibility to provide information that the journalist has. And then the other issue that you may run into early on in your careers is if you are interviewing someone about a topic and you get something wrong and you misquote them or you make an error in what they explain to you, some sort of process or justification or something like that. You're interviewing a lawyer and you get the law wrong or something like that. The general public may not be aware of that error that you have made, but your interview subject certainly will. And when that happens, when they read that article that you have written, then they say, I didn't say that, or, well, they screwed that up then the next time you call them back and you want to talk to them, their answer is going to be no because they've already seen that you didn't get it right the first time. So even if the general public doesn't notice, if you do that with enough of your sources, eventually you're going to run out of people that are going to want to talk to you and your, um, your ability to work is going to be greatly affected. Uh, another issue going on these days, and it's much, much more prevalent. This book was written essentially in the early 90s at the beginning of the social media sea change, cultural sea change that's currently taking effect. Uh, social media was an anomaly back then, but now everyone 
is on social media. And this is just a personal opinion of mine. But one of the things that I have noticed in the way that journalists are thought of these days is that people have their cell phones and they they can use their cell phone to choose their music. They choose the friends that they associate with. They choose the entertainment that they watch. It's all on demand. So they are conditioned into thinking that they can choose the facts that mean something to them and choose what happens in their world. So when they can't, when they're when they're confronted with something that they can't change, instead of accepting that, they tend to believe that there's for some reason something wrong or incorrect that they have to uh, that they have to be able to justify that with. And I will. Uh, we might as well go into it now. I was going to save this for last, but now since I broached the subject, there are a couple of things that they didn't talk about in chapter five, and you can hear my dogs. Um, the first, what I just referenced, is cognitive dissonance. If you're not familiar with that theory, cognitive dissonance is the tendency that people have to discount information that they feel intellectually uncomfortable about. Uh, it's primarily present in polit political discussions, that sort of thing. Uh, if Let's say that you, let's take President Trump, for example, who is one of the most polarizing political figures we've had in decades. If you are a supporter of his, anything negative that you hear, you're going to immediately discount. Uh, that's the whole fake news thing. Uh, well, that's not true. They're just making that up. And if you are against President Trump, anything negative that you hear, you're automatically going to believe because you want to believe it. So when journalists present a story to you and it is favorable or disfavorable to the president, you're going to react accordingly from what you're already wanting and willing to believe. So that's a problem that journalists face. The other is confirmation bias, which sort of is the same thing, but that essentially means that if it sounds good to you and you want it to be true, you're going to be more likely to believe that it's true. So in a very, very polar, polarized political environment, less than a month and a half away from an election, anything that comes out, you're going to decide one way or another whether or not you believe that or not based on something internal within you, not from a journalist's perspective. So it's easier. It's a lot easier to, to kill the messenger than it is to look inward and believe that you may be wrong. So that's something that journalists are facing on top of all of the other issues that they are facing. Uh, the other thing that the uh, author didn't really go into in the chapter on credibility, I touched on it briefly, is what I call news judgment. Essentially deciding what is news and what is not. And I am the editor of the newspapers in the county where I live. I am in a unique position of being the sole arbiter of what is news and what is not. And if I decide it's news, it gets in the newspaper. If I decide it's not, it doesn't. And that's a lot of power to have over the media universe of a small group of people. And in a like in Cincinnati or someplace someplace like that that has a lot of media media platforms, that's not really an issue. But what is news and what is not is a process that the public does not understand. And he talked a little bit about bias in story selection, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But the reason I'm bringing this up first is the biggest manifestation of bias is not what's in a story. The biggest manifestation of bias is whether or not the story even exists. If you decide, I'm not going to do that story because I disagree with the premise of the person that's bringing it forth, like someone's alleging some sort of wrongdoing, and the person making the editorial decision thinks, now that this person's just full of beans, they're they're not 
they're not making sense. I don't think that that's the case. So the journalist doesn't even begin to do the story. That's where a lot of these accusations of bias and favoritisms toward one political party or another exists. Because if you watch some of the news platforms, you will see stories only on Fox News or only on MSNBC or CNN that you don't see on the other platform. And so people who are against the ideological aspect of where those platforms are coming from, Fox viewers don't see something on CNN and say, see, see, they're not publishing that or they're not printing that or broadcasting it because they're holding it back because they disagree, which may or may not be true, but the ability to make the accusation exists because you have so many media platforms where people can choose their news now rather than a couple of generations ago where you just had three TV stations and some national newspapers that were setting the agenda. So um, credibility for the platform is what I'm talking about. So you as an employee of a media platform, whether that's fair or not, or whether you like it or not, you are carrying the baggage of everyone that's come before you. So if someone that used to work there has made some mistakes of commission or omission or something that's obviously biased or something like that, and people have seen that, then the product that you turn out is going to be viewed through that lens. So that makes it even more important that you present yourself as a objective, factual, repeater, and purveyor of information rather than someone who is compromised. So if you have a social media presence, some places require you to have a social media presence. Some of them require you to have one that is based on your professional face to the community. Like a lot of the TV stations around here, for example, require their on-air talent to have social media platforms, but they're, they're labeled with the television station like Joe Smith WXIX rather than Joe Smith. So what you put on social media, how you represent yourself to the public, is another signal to people that are looking for a reason to accuse you of bias to be able to do so. If you happen to be someone that does not support President Trump, for example, and you put anti-Trump stuff all over your social media page, and then you present to the public a story about President Trump, people are going to immediately think whether or not it's true, whether or not you are able to make that professional shift into this is how I feel as an individual. However, as a professional journalist, I'm going to put forth something objective. Even if you make that decision and make that effort, simply because you have represented yourself as an anti-Trump person to people in your social media presence, you have lost the ability to claim objectivity once you put forth that story about the topic that you have made your opinions fairly clear on, if that makes sense. So on my social media pages, I avoid talking about anything controversial within the county that I'm responsible for covering. I don't support or endorse political candidates in the newspaper or on social media because my universe is small enough that word would get around pretty quickly that I have made such a representation. And then any news from that point forward that I try to cover regarding those individuals or uh, those ideas like school levies or things like that, anything that I do after that would be immediately suspect. So that's something that you've got to be got to be careful about. Now, there is the ability to be an effective journalist, but work for something that is obviously partisan. So you can do effective journalism 
if you're working for a a website or an organization that is let's say um, devoted to protecting the environment okay now there are people who are convinced that climate change is not as big a deal as other people want to make it out to be and there are people who think that the coasts are going to be underwater in 25 years unless we make some very large societal changes so let's say that you're on board with the idea that climate change is one of the urgent issues facing mankind and you go to work for a media platform that is devoted to that ideal you are making an ideological choice so anyone that is against the idea that climate change is urgent is going to see your your product as ideologically biased however if you interview people and quote them faithfully and you use facts that they give you and you don't put your own thumb on the scale you can make a credible journalistic product that is sort of filtered through an ideological lens so I hope that makes sense to you so you can do your work in a professional competent way and still someone is going to find a reason to criticize it so the author was absolutely correct this is one of the only professions where people where essentially your customers or the people you're talking to think they know what you're doing they think they know why you're doing it and they think that they can do it just as easy and or even better than you can so you're never going to win the public over 100% there's always going to be somebody out there that has an idea that you for some reason have done something from your own personal motivation that is not the way that they want it done so I'm going to close with an idea that you guys have probably heard that there are annual surveys from the Pew Research Center from Gallup and from a lot of others that say that people think that the news media is biased and they always think that the media is biased against the way that they believe and the funniest thing that came out of that to me was 80 percent of the people think that the other media platforms are biased but only 20 percent think that the media platform they prefer is biased so as long as people are hearing what they want to hear they don't think that there's any problem it's just when they hear something they disagree with that they immediately turn to blame the journalist or the platform for being biased rather than hearing a fact that they may not want to hear so i appreciate you listening to me today and good luck with the rest of the class